Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am proud to have my friend Neil Omerchu joining us on the podcast. Now, Neil is Irish, and I met him at the Wim Hof Retreat in Poland in the early winter of 2020 before COVID started. And he was a leader of my group. He walked us through all the crazy stuff we did at the Wim Hof Retreat, and we stayed in touch over the years. And in the meantime, he's written two books, The Blissful Breath, and one that recently came out called The Power of Cold. Now, The Power of Cold, uh, the uniqueness about that is that Oprah actually took a couple of excerpts or a couple of chapters from it and uh, has been promoting it as well. So the reason I want to have Neil on as well is because he um, is a, uh, you know, a breathing expert. He's uh, an expert in the ice and how to control your breath when you're in the ice. He also is a really good basketball player uh, growing up too. So we talk about that, his time in America, and he actually gives you some good protocols to use as an athlete, as a parent, um, as any member of society. He goes through some breath techniques that can really help regulate, calm you down, get you ready before a game, helps you with some tips during the game and then after the game. And then we get into ice quite a bit uh, due to our shared love of that. So enjoy the podcast with my friend Neil. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights some battles I'm, I'm i'm not sure if they got us if they did maybe maybe so you will get better as a player during that year so it was kind of exciting like oh yeah somebody wants me neil welcome to the podcast thank you for having me last time we saw each other was in early 2020 in Poland, and I had signed up to do the Wim Hof retreat with 99 other people from around the world, and was lucky enough to get you as my lead instructor for the week. And why don't you start out by telling the audience who don't know who Wim Hof is, who Wim Hof is, how you got introduced to him, and why you decided you wanted to work with him? Yeah, so Wim Hof, um, great name, is a Dutchman, um, and initially he was very famous for holding. 25 or so world records for doing incredible things like being encased in ice for hours and running marathons barefoot in the Arctic Circle and, and things like that. But really behind all these big circus acts, Wim's intention was to get the scientific community's attention because he felt that he could use very simple ways of breathing and by combining it with cold to bring about huge improvements in our health and our happiness and our strength. Uh, so eventually Wim having done things like climbed up Mount Everest in a pair of shorts and boots and nothing else, got the scientific community's attention and they have been steadily proving him right for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so I came across Wim talking on a podcast about seven years ago at a point where my four children were very young and uh, myself and my wife, Josie, like you're Josie, um, we, were, we were really struggling with the this, this stresses and strains of being a parent as you can hear, I'm sure the screaming in the background, it never stops. And um, Wim was talking about how he had used the breathing and the cold to change his life, particularly to deal with the grief of his wife killing herself when his four children were, were young. So at that stage, we've ha we had loads of people in our family that we loved uh, tragically pass away. So we were also grief stricken as well as and heartbroken as well as under stress. Uh, so we started to breathe a little bit every night and do the cold showers. And, and the, the change was so, so immediate and it was so deep that very quickly we decided to try and find out about as much about this as possible. And that led me down the route to becoming an instructor. And that led me eventually to meeting you in Poland. Yeah. And then, um, you know, on that trip in Poland, the two of the graduation moments for us, if you want to call them graduation moments, but two of the big feats we did were first hiking up a mountain in just boots, shorts, and a hat on, right? And I think we did six miles, and, I, and the day we did it was actually sunny, about 17 degrees, and I, I get cold so easy because I'm so skinny. And due to the training we did all week with the breathing, um, with, the, with the mindset, I, I didn't shiver once and just was amazed I made it up that way. And one thing I noticed with you on that trip is you guys as instructors had to wear clothes and you were sweating usually <laughs> in 17 <laughs> degrees. Tell me how that works. Does your body run hot always or is that from your training you've done? 
that's from the training, you know, during that period when, when Josie and I were really struggling with the children and they were young, you know, I was exhausted all the time and stressed all the time. And often when that's the case, uh, we feel cold because our circulation isn't working as it should. But over the years, slowly by, by slow, steady and safe exposure to the cold, the very tissues in our body start to change. So where we have, say, white fat, for example, which stores energy, that slowly changes to what's known as brown fat, which actually, which actually generates energy. And it takes other fat stores and turns them into energy. And over time, that also helps us to build up this. And, you know, we're not even conscious of it, this resistance to the cold. So when I first went up the mountain like you all those years ago, um, I got to the top and I was in a pair of shorts and I put my top back on. But I never really took the shorts off from that moment, you know, so I w wore shorts then all winter. And at the moment, this is kind of my uniform now in the depths of winter. And it's not like a conscious thing where I'm trying to trying to do it. It's just the body is changing slowly over time. Um, and when we're bringing you all up the mountain, our role is different. So we have to be totally safe and we have to wear clothes. But the kind of strange irony is that I'm not used to wearing clothes. So when I'm wearing clothes on the mountain, bringing people up, it's like I'm in some kind of sauna. You know, I'm sweating. It's a, but um, it's an important part of, you know, the safety that we don't have to think about our own dealing with the cold. We can totally focus on you. Yeah. So I just want to share that, with, which what uh, just how Neil's body's working now is just is crazy. It's, a <laughs> it's a testament to all the training you've done. But on top, to me, the the hike was great. You know, you've seen videos on YouTube where it's like winter conditions and um, blizzards and what and people are struggling. Like it was not easy, but it definitely wasn't a challenge as much as the 10 minutes in the water was. And that was kind of our other thing yes. we worked up to during that week was, you know, we got in the water and this is January in Poland. You know, we're mm. getting in like a river that's with all, all snow melt. It's probably 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And we worked our way up and our graduation was... 10 minutes in the water and you know i've done a podcast before about cold um here and um you know usually the max you want to stay in is three minutes to get all the benefits uh of the cold before after that you don't really get much more but 10 yeah. was not about physicality it was about you know a lot up here and i'm not gonna lie it's one of the toughest things i've done in my life and it jarred something loose that day uh in a good way that i know i can do it but it, it it's it hurt it was scary um, it felt like 25 minutes and it, it was rough. It took us a long time to warm back up, but tell us about the, uh, you know, why you do 10 minutes there in training and what, what we're supposed to get out of it. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. There's great research to show that the maximum amount of time per week over seven days that we should be in the cold is 11 minutes. So imagine you're seven days you're 11 minutes divided by seven days. So it shows us that we only need a little bit of cold every day, a minute and a half, two minutes maximum. As you said, you know, there's, a, there's a, a limit like that. And that is to get the most physical benefits from it. But of course, when we're away and we don't have to think about our jobs, or we don't have to think about the spreadsheets and the, and, and, the, and the work and the shopping and all that kind of stuff, it allows us time to really delve deeply into ourselves and I wouldn't recommend 10 minutes in the cold for anybody unless you are within the context of a retreat like that, surrounded by professional e expert instructors. And the whole purpose of that, as you said, is to help us find a way in our minds to deal with it. And in that process, we learn so, so much from ourselves. I remember I did a 10 minute one like yourselves as part of my instructor training. And I still remember it because I still remember those moments in those 10 minutes where time seems to slow down and you, you know, you're, you have moments of elation and euphoria and you have moments of despair in there as well. And I suppose what it's showing us is that we are capable of a lot more than we think we are, even though we don't have to go there very often. Every now and then, we just have to remind ourselves of it. But having a 10 minute ice bath you know, it's one of those things you do maybe once or twice in your life and that's yeah. enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I say, I say I want to work my way back up to like five minutes, six minutes, seven. And it just, it scares me. There's something about it. And I, yeah. I've been doing the ice a lot. And I, heck, I did it yesterday just, you know, to get ready for this call. And um, I lasted probably a minute, minute and a half. And 
only after reading your book, which we'll get to, did I realize that's okay. That's all I needed to do mm -hmm. that day. But yes. 10 minutes, I'm telling you, it's just, it's, it will never leave me. I'll think about that on my deathbed as being one of the hardest things I've done in my life, but fulfilling. But something jarred loose that day, not in a bad way. It's yeah. just something changed. I was yeah. a diff I'm a different Corey after that 10 minutes. And after yeah. the, the holotropic breathing we did one night with Wim too, you know, that really was effective too um, and different. But one story I want to say is, um, and I, I texted this to you, Neil, after a short few months after we did the retreat. But when we got back, COVID hit, right? And my wife and I were having problems having our second child. We were going to sign up and do IVF. And even with IVF, we had a 2% chance. So anyway, we signed the papers. We're going to do it. And bam, everything got shut down because of COVID. So we're sitting in our house and we used your uh, one of your YouTube videos with your kids in the background. Uh, and my wife and I just started doing Wim Hof or you know, not Wim Hof, but you're breathing every morning um, just because, you know, we, we were in a new house. Yeah. We just moved here. Everything was shut down. We didn't know what was going to happen. And I'll be damned. We got pregnant with our second daughter. And I'm not saying it's the Wim Hof method. I'm not saying it's your voice, but that's the only thing we changed. And, you know, our diet stayed the same, our exercise stayed the same, our stress is about the same. So I'm not saying that's the cause for it happening, but it's pretty interesting that that's, you know, coming back from Poland and doing that, you know, even with a 2% chance of getting pregnant with science, um, yeah. we somehow got pregnant against the odds. So it, yeah. it sounds like you've had that experience before. You've heard about that or even happened yeah. to you in the past. I, I've, I've heard, yeah, like we had, we had two children and then we had, you start doing a bit of breeding and then we had twins, you know? So like there, there is a track record of, of um, fertility improving. Definitely. You know, and, and it kind of makes sense, especially I think. So it makes sense in, in some ways we know from the science that it does amazing things for our immune system. It reduces stress. It, it improves so many, it, it reduces inflammation, improve, improves so many things, these huge big things in our, in our bodies and our minds. And if all those things are improving in both people, and I think that's important, you know, Josie and I, and you, you know, you're saying there, you're, yourself and your Josie and myself and my Josie, we were doing it together. And I think there's something in that as well. I think there's something in that kind of journey together and that commitment together, even though there was no, for yourselves, there was no end goal really to, to end up where you end up. But, you know, just to share that experience, um, and it's not it's not unheard of. I've heard lots of people say very similar things. So like it's not an official uh, it's not an official benefit of the Wim Hof method, but I've heard it quite a lot. Yeah, interesting, interesting. I mean, if they, that's a scientific experiment to do, right? I know. And you know what? It could really help so many people because, as you said, you know the percentages aren't great sometimes. Like two percent isn't a particularly you know good percentage for success you know for, for some roots so um a little bit of breathing together and colds together might help a lot of people help a lot of people uh when, when was your first experience getting in the cold so i i'm from i live on the south side of dublin now but i'm from the north side the north county dublin part of the city and so i live by the beach all the time so i was always swimming in the sea um even the cold as a teenager and stuff, but lost, moved to London and, and lost track of it. So when I came back and came across Wim Hof, I had been back swimming in the winter sea in Ireland a good bit, not, not connecting my love of breathing and meditation over here and the cold, having not connected that yet. And then when I heard Wim talking, my first ice bath was in Wim's house, you know, mm. in this paddling, uh, paddling pool out the back. You know, and then I was sitting in the ice bath and then Wim jumps in the ice bath beside me and then other people. And I was like, firstly, the shock of an ice bath, you know, like it's shocking no matter how many times you do it. And then Wim Hof jumping in beside me, it was like a double shock. It was like, I, I got out and just thought to myself, what just happened there? You know, so that was my first time in an ice bath at the very beginning of the instructor training. But what it showed me was the type of person I am, I felt that I needed to really understand what was down there in the depths of the cold in order to guide people through it. So I came back from the Netherlands with Wim and I committed to myself that I would do an ice bath every day for a hundred days, you nice. know, and that was maybe seven years ago and it hasn't really stopped, but the initial hundred days was to try and really understand the cold as much as I could before I started to bring people through that experience as well. And after that hundred days, what, what takeaways did you have? 
I, I suppose I was I was shocked at the difference it made. You know, the difference it made in in my mood. It, you know, because no matter what you're feeling going in, you are a different person going out. Mm-hmm. And we know that from we know it balances our hormones. We know is you know we know it does lots of things. But that was the first thing that shocked me was like, this is an immediate reset. So it became a tool then. You know, it wasn't just a practice where I had to go in and I knew it was good for me became a tool where i'd feel like if the day had been tough i know if i got into the ice bath i'd get out and i'd be grand you know so that was probably the biggest the biggest part of it and then the other two things were that there was always a sense of trepidation getting in so even now thousands of ice baths later there's always a part of you that's thinking to yourself what the hell are you doing this for you know so i think that never changes but our ability to override that and to see what's on the other side changes. Uh, and then the third thing is that it's always different. No yes. matter w- how many times you do it, some days it might seem easy and that lulls you into a false sense of security and the next day it's something totally different. Uh, and those three lessons have stayed with me. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. My next question was, do you still have trepidation getting in? And it like <laughs> yeah. Some days you do and some days you don't. And Fun story on that, you know, I've, I've been taking a lot of people in, just nothing official, but just like, hey, if you want to get yeah. in the creek, I can help yeah. you, you know, get through fight or flight, get your breath, and yeah. then, you know, walk you through it. And uh, I've done that to a lot of people and enjoy doing doing it and introducing people. And then yeah. last year, like the first time I did a dip in our creek about 20 minutes away, I, I lasted at 45 seconds because it just hurt. And I got yeah. out and I was shook because I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. I'm the guy that's supposed to be confident, <laughs> supposed to, to do, know how to do this. And I would be taught, you know, if I was standing next to me right now, I would have talked myself through it and made it the two minutes. Yeah. But it just, it hurt. And I was really like, sh- my, my confidence was shaken. And yeah. uh, so you're right. I do say that. That's why I go so much is because every time is different. And sometimes every that three time. minutes is is calm and it's like that. Yeah. And other times. <laughs> yeah. It feels like three minutes and it's been 38 seconds. And <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm and it's encouraging it's all, to hear like, that still happens to you. Yeah. And, and I suppose in one way, the cold is often like a reflection, a mirror back to us. And all it's reflecting back to us is that we are actually different every single day, even though mm-hmm. we get up and we might get up at the same time and, you know, go to the kitchen and get the coffee or tea at the same place. And, and kind of forget that we're actually different every single day. But when we get into the cold, then we can really feel that. Because as you said, sometimes we can we can ease our way through those moments in the cold. And sometimes it is a struggle from the moment we get in there. Well, we're going to talk about your book in a little bit. But yesterday, I was really, uh, when I did my first real cold dip of the season here, uh, I was really focusing on the exhale. And that was a good mm-hmm. reminder, right? I mean, I do sometimes yeah. focus on breath, but I'm kind of in shape now in the cold. And I can look around yeah. and talk and... Yeah, but, uh, it was good to do that. But I want to hear I'm going to share mine and then I want to hear yours. But I'm going to tell you my best experience ever dipping. It was like a yeah. day like today. It was snowing outside here in the mountains. I drove to my spot 18 minutes away and I got out of the car with no shoes on, just my swim trunks. And it was snowing probably 15 degrees out. And I was in such a zen state. I walked down the snowy path, got in the water, did my three minutes, got out did a little horse dance walked back to the car and it was just, I was calm. I was zen. <laughs> no one was around. It was quiet. And that to me is on my Mount Everest uh, or my Mount Rushmore yeah. of, of experiences. And I'm once again, trying to chase that dragon sometimes to get back yes. to that state when I had no idea yeah. at the time yeah. I was even going to have that experience. But do you have an experience, Neil, that you think back on that was just, everything was clicking and it was perfect. Yeah, sometimes I've had I've had moments in the cold. I, I describe in the book where you fall in love with everything. You know, just everything is beautiful. You know, the cold is beautiful. The trees around are beautiful. Even the struggle is is beautiful. They're rare. You know, they they happen, but they're rare. But. I like that. I think there's a just some some of those moments, and I notice myself. So, like you described there, there there are moments when you are actually in the in the flow of everything that's happening. So you got you got out of your car and just walk straight down. You got back in. You walk straight back. You know. But most of the days, my mind is trying to say to me. I try to practice like that. I try to say, okay, I'm going into the ice bath now. 
and nothing is stopping me. I'm just like walking out the back, to, you know, no, nothing but my swim shorts on, going straight in. But the the mind is always like, yeah, but hold on a second. You, you need to pick that thing up over there or you need to go do something, over, you know, trying to, you know, stop the process from happening. And I think those those Zen moments are beautiful, but they also the the moments that are a struggle to get in and the moments that are a struggle to find that Zen moment are also beautiful because they, they that's what the practice is. You know, the practice is there's no good or bad. The practice mm-hmm. is just doing it. That's the thing. And some of those experiences are amazing to have, and it's human nature to try and chase them, I think, as well. But it's the practice of it that is is the great part of it. Yeah, and we'll talk about your book now because you mentioned that story in your book about you going to meditate at the Shaolin Temple. Yes. You, you want to explain that? Yeah. Well, I, I after my basketball career was over, I was kind of looking for answers. And one of the first places I turned was martial arts. And uh, they opened the Shaolin Temple in London. So I moved to London to learn how to fight. And the first thing they did was look at me and tell me, no, oh, no, no, we have to teach you how to, to breathe and to, and to meditate. Um, so that was that was the first part of it. And I suppose the cold is like a meditation. You know, the, if, if we think about meditation as as focusing on one thing, whether it's the breath or, or whatever it is, and, and letting everything else fall away, the cold is very much a meditation when we can, when we can focus on our breath and when we, we can move into that state. And then that starts to flow into other parts of our life as well yeah perfect now let's do talk about your book power of the cold uh tell us why when this came out and tell us why you decided to write it so the book is just out maybe six or seven weeks i think and it's available all over the world it's actually sold out in in europe already so awesome uh it's on its way and the audible version uh narrated by myself should be up in the next two weeks or so um so I was approached. My first book, The Blissful Breath, was all about breathing, and I was approached by the publisher. They said, "Would you like to have a stab at, you know, writing a book about the benefits of the cold?" And I'd been teaching it for so long, and I had seen so many things that I thought um, people would benefit from that I I decided to to write it. But when I write a book, I always have somebody in mind, you know. So I had two people in mind when I was writing this book. One is the person who hates the cold but knows that you know the cold is inevitable part of, of life nearly depending on where you live. And the other person was the person who already gets into the cold and makes the effort and to help them get more profound benefits from, from the effort they're already making. Um, and to, to plot out this path, this path that can lead us from where we are into the cold, through into the shock and chaos of the cold and to learn how to find that calm and control in the cold and along the way, you get all the benefits. So that was my my thought process for writing it. And then it was just a matter of sitting down and trying to figure out how to take those thoughts and, and make them into something that people could understand. Yeah. And you've got a unique style for this book, like both The Blissful Breath and this one. Um, it, it's not like normal books. It's a little bit smaller. It's got yeah. uh, you know different ways of chapters uh, look. You've got quotes in there. Where did you come up with, you know, the formatting of this? So the publisher in London, they're really good. And we had a good chat about how I wanted the books to, to be. So the grand plan, Corey, is that there's 10 books in, okay. in, on, in, on, on their way. This is the second one. Um, but they, uh, in my mind, I wanted them to fit together. Like, do you remember those old encyclopedia collections people used to have in their houses <laughs> before the internet came? Yes. Um, and, you know, so that the books would all fit together in this kind of sequence. But I always, the shape of the book, I'm always outside somewhere. And I wanted the book to be able to fit in someone's pocket so they could bring it with them no matter where they were. And yes. they could pick it up wherever they were and read it no matter where they were. And that was, that was the kind of shape of it. But the publishers were great. They, they, they are totally responsible for the design of it and how the quotes all fit in. Uh, I, can't, I can take no credit for that except for approving their designs, which were brilliant. And you get some recognition from Oprah too about this book. Tell me about yes. that. <laughs> so uh, I got this email from the publisher saying, um, Oprah wants to feature the book on her website. Is that okay? And I was like, let me think about that for maybe a millisecond. Yeah, that, that's grand over there. 
<laughs> there you go. So they were really good to work with, and they, I think they enjoyed the, um, they enjoyed hearing about how it particularly helped Josie and I get through some difficult times. And they took a couple of the chapters and they very skillfully kind of merged them together. And um, and I hope from from just that little bit of information that they put up on on the website, they featured two chapters that some people got to benefit from the code from it. Nice. And we will be including um, your Linktree account on the show notes for this. So folks, Thank you. if you want to buy The Power of Cold or uh, Blissful Breathing, or is it The Blissful Breath? Uh, the Blissful Breath. The Blissful Breath, uh, you'll be able to do that uh, down below in the show notes afterwards. And both of these are in my household. I read both of them, loved them. And Neil's going to, we're going to get into more on how the cold and the breath work can benefit you. But, you know, not only you being my friend, not only... Uh, doing the breathing and the cold stuff, without, which I'm all about. You know, another unique thing about you, Neil, is that you played basketball. And Ireland's yes, not really I known did. for being a big basketball country. But tell me how you got into it. And, uh, yeah, tell me how you got into it first and what, what sparked that love. Yeah, well, it, it was actually um, in 1985. I was about nine, I think, or ten and uh, nine years old. And my dad worked for General Electric here in Dublin. And he was, we were transferred. He got a job. He transferred to Columbus, Ohio. Um, and so in 1985, we packed up here in Dublin, moved to Columbus, Ohio, just before Christmas. And at that stage, like Ireland is a very different place now. But back then, we had really high unemployment rates, really high uh, drug problems. You know, the country wasn't in a great state. So landing into Columbus, Ohio, the first time I ever saw snow, you know, and all the Christmas lights and we went to our new house and it was magical. And in the driveway was mm. a basketball hoop. And I had never even seen one before, you know. So I just started playing basketball and dad took me to uh, Ohio State University, the old St. John Arena. So we went yeah. there to watch. I think we went, went to, I think we watched Kentucky you know, uh, at one stage. Anyway, so the, my kind of my love for basketball grew and I had a very... I had a very nice coach who was the coach in, in the primary school that I went to in uh, St. Michael's Primary School. And he took pity on the strange young Irish boy who was starting to play basketball. And he included me in the basketball team for maybe the two years I was in school there. And that really ignited my love for it. And then when I got back to Ireland, it's not a, it's not a huge sport in Ireland. Um, it definitely wasn't back then. But we were, you know, as I worked my way up, I eventually played uh, on the Irish national team from about age 16 to age 21. So oh um, I got to play, I got to play uh, all over Europe and, uh, you know, really loved it. And, and about now basketball is different now. Like well, I love to see all the Europeans in, in the NBA, but you have to go back to the early nineties pre-internet. Uh, you know, America was a million miles away and, you know, a million times better than anyone in Europe. And, um, I was playing in the Euro European Championships against Estonia, Ukraine, Sweden, and Czech Republic, and I was the highest scorer in in the in, it was under nineteen years old in in the uh, tournament, and I was the first Irish person ever to win anything at an international tournament. You know, so uh, that that's where it all that's where it all kind of went in the end. But I got a chance to go and play in america once or twice i won an award to go to villanova uh basketball camp uh, in philadelphia and play there for a couple of weeks and everything so yeah i love basketball and it's also great to see now with the internet how we can watch euro basket games we can watch games from asia we can watch you know and and it, the world has become a kind of smaller place in a way and there's you know the, the level of basketball outside of america has improved greatly in the last 20 years Oh, it's a global game now, which you know. So, yeah. and just so you know, when you were in Columbus, Ohio, I was two hours away in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, no way. So, and you did you go to any camps at all during your time? Um, not in Columbus, but I did go to camps when I was maybe seventeen or eighteen uh, around kind of Ohio area and somewhere else, like Metro Index. There were like recruitment camps, you know. So, yeah, uh, myself and loads of uh, high school students battling it out, and it was great. You know, because uh, the standard in Europe then was was okay, not like it is now, but it was amazing to go to the mecca of basketball, America, of course, and to, to test myself over there. 
Well, here's another thing too. When I was 1993, summer 93, my high school team, Lexington Catholic, went to Ireland to County Kildare. And we no ended up way. playing the national team and beat the, the the tar out of them. So were you on that team by chance? No, in 93? no, no. 93, where was I? I was probably, I actually went as a, uh, I think I was actually in America at that stage. I've been in America a good few times now at the, okay. uh, over the years. But uh, yeah, it's, just, you know, things have, the internet has opened things up so much. You know, it's, even I see now that, you know the 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 level of coaching in Ireland, for example, is light years ahead of where it was before, because it was, you know we were on this island on the on the edge of Europe, you know nowhere near America, nowhere near Europe really in some senses, and now the influence of Europe on Irish basketball and American Irish basketball and, and European basketball it's a it's a different world. Yeah, well, it's absolutely a different world. And uh, but back to Ireland, I know that was uh, ninety three. And we did a bunch of clinics for kids around there because I wow. think in Lexington, our sister city was uh, County Kildare because of the horses yeah. and all that. So we went to the Irish Derby uh, when we were there. But uh, we played like the under-18 national team and beat them by 50. In fact, all the people in the stands were cheering for us because we were pretty good. <laughs> and they, they canceled all our other games against like high school teams and made us play against men's pro teams. And yeah. those were closer games. I mean, we got beat because these were men. But um, yeah. Yeah, still, yeah. Still, very, and very it, memorable it, experience. Yeah, and it's a, it's amazing now. This the the gap is closer than it used to be. Oh yeah. You know, so back then, like the American teams coming over were so more advanced and so much fitter and everything. It's it's incredible. Even even in the national setup here, everything is just totally different than it was before. Everything is totally different. It's great to see, as you said, it's a global game now. Yeah, and then you played professional in Estonia, didn't you? I played a little bit in in different parts of Europe, but definitely not professional. I played in Estonia okay. in a couple of in a tournament, but uh, that's a bit too small for the professional leagues. <laughs> gotcha. Your your highlight was was winning that MVP of the highest yeah league, yeah scoring of that thing. Man, that's still great. That's and those teams all now have produced pros, right? Plenty of them. Yeah, and like and when we played internationally, Ireland was decent up until about. When we were 16, 15, under 15, under 16, under 17, we could hang with some of the teams. But then as it got to 18, 19, it, it just jumped. You know, the, the, most of those countries had professional leagues and it, the standard just jumped. But, um, yeah, we played against Ukraine. Now, obviously, we think about the Ukraine in a different way now, but the Ukraine is an amazing basketball team and sure. Sweden. And, and, yeah, it was a great experience. And we were in Estonia. And they were they were broadcasting all those games live on Estonian TV. Now you can imagine there's not much on Estonian TV back in 1991 or 1992. So it was a, it was a, it was prime time. <laughs> we were in Estonia. I went over there with a high school team from Kentucky Every, for three years in a row. We went to Finland for like a Christmas wow. tournament, and then um, one year, like our high school team went. I was in junior high, and we took the boat over to Tallinn, and everyone got sick. So they were like three high school players left so i had to dress right as so i'm a seventh no grader dressing and playing and then our coach's son who's like 25 he's dressing and playing and i was <laughs> terrified out there right <laughs> i was terrified but yeah Tallinn's an all right place um, but let me ask you this have there been any nba players from ireland yes there's been a couple um there was a man called pat burke who played i'm oh, not Pat. was it pat burke he played for the Magic. He played for yeah. the Suns. Uh, I think he got a ring with somebody. I think he was on a team that got a ring. So there's been a few. There's a, there's a great player now. Um, where is he playing? He's playing in one of the big Division One colleges, and they they are kind of touting as as an NBA prospect. Aiden, and he has he's like his his parents are from Africa, so he has an African kind of last name. But yeah, there's some the standard now. You know, there's a different route before. Like when I was growing up you had to go to America to college or somewhere like that to kind of make it up to the ranks. And now the route is you go the opposite direction and you go into the pro leagues in Europe at like right. 15 or six, 15 or 16. And you're kind of, you're, you're, you are a pro from that age and you kind of go up the ranks that way. And, and many people don't even go beyond that. They kind of stay in Europe as a pro and that's a, that's a viable career now. Um, but of course, everyone wants to get to the big league. It's easier to get struck by lightning twice. 
I can well imagine. I can well imagine. That's why they're yeah. such exceptional people. And I saw on your website, did you have um do you have a coach? I saw a profile of a coach on your website that had, had been in the NBA for like 13 years as an all-star and everything. Oh, that's my cousin who I grew up with. No way. Yeah, Brad Miller. He uh yeah, he uh, he and I are he's six months older than I am and um yeah, he just got he got my dad's genes. My mom is skinnier and smaller, uh, and my dad's big and huge. And he played pro as well. And uh, yeah, my cousin got that and just for some reason made it to the NBA and was a two time wow. All Star. In fact, he was an All Star uh, in Michael Jordan's last All Star game. No, what a historic thing to be so, part of. So I actually went there with him to hang out all weekend. And um, every time I'm in the elevator in the hotel, it's like Kobe Bryant's going up with me. Oops, Steph Marbury's coming down. <laughs> There's Yao Ming's and parents yeah. and their giants. Oh you know? People are asking me for my <laughs> autographs. I'm like, I am just riding the elevator. I am no one famous. <laughs> You're like, there you go. But, but that that's an amazing was experience. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. That's a, that's like a once in a lifetime experience. Well, we used to have pictures of Jordan on our uh, posters on our yeah. wall, and then here he is, his teammate. And he's got some stories. I mean, he's he's been on the podcast. He got famous for getting in a fight with Shaquille O'Neal. And that's when everyone knew who he was. They're like, oh, that's your cousin, the guy, the white boy fighting Shaq. I was like, yeah, that's Brad. So <laughs> that's a big opponent to go after. If you're gonna go, if you're gonna fight someone in the NBA, you might as well go for the biggest person. Go big. Yeah. yeah so yeah. uh yeah. So anyway, so all the NBA stuff, I've seen it up close. I know behind the scenes, it's 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 not all it's cracked up to be. There's so many things that the people don't talk about challenges and, um, and stuff. It's just, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Yeah. That money does not yeah, come from your expectations. No, for no, no. And, and really in a way that it's human commodity dealing, you know, like the, you, you are a piece of you. You're a human, but they, they're looking at you as like a commodity, like all business, you know, yeah. traded or, um uh, uh, you know but it's it's uh so your cousin is has been struck twice by lightning then yes to get yes. that <laughs> <laughs> he's one of the lucky ones especially making an all-star game he was the only uh um uh, yeah, he was just he just he made it in the east coast one year with jordan and then he got traded to the sacramento kings and then made it on the west coast right wow. so i used to have in my office pictures of him on the east coast with like jordan paul pierce all these guys and the next year it's him Kobe, Shaq, Kevin Garnett, Dirk Nowitzki. It's just like, what are you, what's going on here? Are we in, are we in a simulation right now? Are we, yeah, yeah. Simulation theory. But when you mentioned Dirk, Dirk was like, for me, that was a point, a turning point in, in basketball, European basketball with Dirk over there playing. And that, and now there's loads of Dirks, you know, like there's loads yeah. of great European players out there. Um, so that was a big change. Yeah, just a quick tip. If you're watching this on YouTube right now and you see me moving around, it's because I got a bright sun coming in. <laughs> I'm trying not to be a pure glare right now. So I know Neil's watching me and seeing my background change and me moving around the screen. I'm trying to avoid this glare. If we were more professional here at Prep Athletics, we'd have a podcast studio. But I live in the sunniest <laughs> state a, in that's America. A that's a beautiful uh, place you are there. So you have to use it, of course. Oh, it's great. But yeah, it's uh, it's anyway, I... My wife's a filmmaker, and uh, she would just, if she ever watched this, she would just be like, what are you <laughs> doing? <laughs> but, Neil, I want to I finish up our conversation here um, and see how we can incorporate, see how our listeners can incorporate this in their lives, and specifically basketball players. So I know a lot of parents listen to this, but a lot of basketball players do too. Yeah. And you've got so much more knowledge now on the breath, on mindfulness, on the cold than you did when you were a player so yeah. if you could kind of go in a time machine and talk to young Neil, like what kind of protocols would you, you suggest that young Neil would do to, you know, help him either in performance in recovery and mindfulness? Yeah. We'd love to hear your prescription on this. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky in the job that I do now that I work with lots of elite athletes. So Olympic champions, professional teams, and you know what I would what I would say to them is what I would say to myself back there in, in all those years ago that you know if we look at performance we can break performance down roughly speaking in three parts your your preparation your performance and your recovery afterwards and really our control of our breathing is is essential to every part of that process so let's say 
anyone who's playing in any type of you know uh, top level sport or even any type of sport knows those feelings before when you're preparing to to perform so you know the heart rate can be too high the body can be tense and um, we can you know the, the mind can kind of run away with itself but all those things can be reversed the, the heart rate can be slow the body can be soft the mind can be prepared if we can control the breath so really our breath is a reflection of how we think and how we feel and how we react to the pressure so if we were to look at a person, let's say they're going out to play um, this huge basketball game. If we were to look at their heart rate and their breathing, their respiratory rate, it would probably be quite high before they go out if they don't know what they're doing. And of course, that is eating up, eating up all their energy. It's also kind of draining them because their adrenaline is going up and then this kind of this drop comes as well. So very simply, learning how to control I like it. We mentioned earlier that long, slow exhale. So if we're in the locker room or even if we're visualizing it days beforehand, if we can control and bring our breathing to this long, slow exhale from this, it'll be like this normally if they're really tense. But if we can slow that long exhale down, heart rate starts to drop, body starts to loosen. And all of a sudden then, it's not only the body starts to follow suit, the brain is always listening to the lungs. The, the, brain is getting, the brain is getting probably a million trillion signals from the body every second. The messages from the lungs override everything. Because obviously if our lungs are in trouble, the whole body is in trouble, our life is in trouble. So the body is taking it, the mind is taking its cue, the brain is taking its cue from the lungs. So if the lungs start to calm down and they start to slow down and they start to focus on an exhale, that message goes to the brain and the brain starts releasing that down to the body. You're safe. Everything's fine. Even the blood vessels start to open up again. You know, so we feel more relaxed. There's more blood going. We don't feel as tired. So that, that controlling of the exhale is so important for any athlete. I've worked with Olympic champions who have, not, they, like they're gold medal winners and they're still struggling with these moments before the performance. And this long exhale is the thing that changes everything for people. My son was fighting in a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournament recently and this is what we were doing before he went out and had to fight somebody. You know, in those moments of just like, you're being overwhelmed, you're about to step out onto the court or, you know, so... That's the that's the one thing to take away. Long, slow exhales. There's a whole chapter of it in the blissful breath. We return to it again in the power of cold. It's how we deal with the cold. It's how we deal with with, with all that pressure. Once then into the into the match, into the game itself, learning how to breathe under pressure is a more complicated kind of practice. But the simple thing for people to think about is when we start breathing through our nose our breathing becomes calmer, our body becomes calmer. If we're breathing through our mouth, like I look back at pictures of me playing basketball and all I am doing is breathing through my mouth. So if we're breathing through our, through our mouth, we are pushing our body up into fight or flight. We are expending so much energy in that kind of state, heightened state. We're also dehydrating. So for the athlete who you know, is, is really at the top level, this is a, a big, big problem as well. So even... Um, Closing the mouth in, in, you know, timeouts, in free throats, whatever it is, and learning to use our nose again, that immediately calms the body down. Even just breathing through our nose for three or four in, inhales and exhales. So in the performance, and, and the way we get to that point is during our practice, during our training sessions, if our coach is saying, like, in the middle of drills, okay, boop, everyone, breathe through your nose for the next minute getting people to learn how to breathe through their nose so then in the game we can never remember the way to breathe in the crisis unless we have practiced it before the crisis you know let's say there's three seconds on the sh on the on the shot on the game clock you're down by one your coach is running a play to get you the ball to shoot this 20 foot jump shot if you have not practiced how to calm your breathing before then, you are not going to be able to do it in that moment under that pressure.
So, so for the coaches or parents listening to this, even getting their, their children to practice breathing through their nose when they're practicing, you know, to, when they're playing basketball before the match and before the game, and then in the game, just finding those moments to breathe through the nose. The recovery then, that's where the cold comes in, you know, so a nice hot shower, finish with cold, that's a great way to recover. But really, the thing that runs through elite performance in sports now is our ability to breathe. It's the thing that most people overlook. We all think about uh, levels of strength, conditioning, fitness, tactics, you know, all of those things. All of those things we get more from if we are able to control how we breathe. Love it. That's what I would say say to my younger self. <laughs> Love it. No, that's key. That is key. And I actually found myself breathing through my nose and slower, slow my exhale down during that just as a good reminder that not even a player, parents, anyone listening to this, anyone in society can yeah. use these tricks just to reset. And it can take you, yeah. you know, just a couple minutes and you will feel it immediately. And especially, especially for, and this is something I work with some of the, the big sports teams on, especially for the coach, you know, because the coach's internal state influences down through the team. So if the coach is feeling on the edge, you can tell, you know, the players will feel that tension as well. So the coach using the breath to, to calm him or herself down, that then, you know, in all hierarchical teams with the coach at the top, the players are often mimicking the behavior of the coach. Right. You know, so, so if they see the coach being calm, the coach doesn't always have to be calm, you know, but if they see the coach being calm and using the breath, they just mimic that. And all of a sudden, a team that feels and a player that feels calm and feels open and feels loose, all of a sudden, they're enjoying the game. All of a sudden, the shots go down. Everything is a little easier. It's when we're tense like this and we're thinking too much and the body's tight and we're not breathing. That's when the shots drop a little bit too short. That's when the pass is a little bit long or whatever it is. So uh, that breath is so important. And I think some pro athletes like LeBron, I think he's got a breath coach. I think he's got a sleep coach. Yeah, yeah. it's become more and more prevalent nowadays. I think about three or four years ago, uh, at least a handful of the NFL teams drafted in breathing specialists into their coaching staff. Um, now, I'm sure that's I'm sure that's leaked into Major League Baseball and, and the NBA as well. A lot of the a lot of the, the pro teams here in Europe and soccer and things like that have it as as part of it. And even the Irish rugby team here, which was ranked the top rugby team in the world, even though they lost in the quarterfinals of the World Cup, anyway. But they had they had breathing as one of the key pillars of their of their performance strategy. So it's starting to it's starting to creep into into sports now. Yeah, that's that's it's good. It's gonna be the future. That and sleep and cold. It's gonna be the future. Let me ask you this: on my Instagram feed, which I'm not on very often, but I've done a lot of ice pictures. It seems like every ad I get is for a, a different type of cold plunge that's been invented. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> I'm sure you I have to as well, right? <laughs> I get that. Every second, every second ad is about that. Every every ad is about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure they're good ones. What are your thoughts on cold plunges? Um, it just depends on what the person needs. You know, you, you sound like you have a great setup there, going to the local creek and jumping in, you know, and for a lot of people, you know, that's the most ideal way to do it, somewhere natural like that. But in lots of really hot countries or parts of America even. You know, keeping that keeping that cold uh, water cold in the summertime is more difficult. But I, I actually think, having grown a little bit wiser uh, and a little bit older, I think our cold exposure training should probably move with the seasons a little bit. You know, so like where you live, it gets colder and colder in the winter, and you know you're you're learning to endure that. And you're, but then it comes back around and it starts to warm up a little bit. And I think we should move with that as well. So I'm not sure if if you know, going into the extreme freezing cold all year round, the same temperature is good for us. I think it should probably, it, you know, it should be at its coldest in the winter and should probably mm-hmm. change a little bit and kind of come around. Um, I think there's, a, there's an element of that as well. So whatever the person, whatever the person needs, there's so many kind of, there's a range of expensive ones to cheap ones, and, you know, right. and, and there's a lot more kind of gyms have them now as well. But the best thing is your beautiful hot shower, turn it to cold at the end. 
that's as good as it gets. But you know, I got friends in Florida who complain that the water doesn't get cold enough down there. Yeah, the well, that's fair enough. <laughs> but you live in Florida, might... so <laughs> yeah, that's gonna happen. Yeah, is there anything you want to discuss or, or mention that we haven't talked about today, Neil? Um, I, I think for we, we're we're talking here about basketball specifically. Uh, you mentioned it though. Anything that we're talking about here for performance everyone's performance is different a performance can be on the court but it's also a performance to raise children to try and balance a job and 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 a life you know everything we do is a performance of sorts so anything that we've talked about here for in terms of helping basketball players or athletes it's the same for everybody you know we can all do with a little bit more breathing and a little bit more cold in our lives yeah love it love it i've even got my dad getting in the cold now so oh wow! It's, it's seventy-three. Yeah, he he's loving it. He's addicted. There's only one person that I've introduced to to the cold that didn't like it, and that was my mom. So uh, she listens to this. She, we'll get her back around again. But, uh, but, but yeah, and, and, and there's there's loads of great research to show now that you know there was this old idea that you know w- women sometimes felt cold more than men. But lots of research is showing us that their nervous system does actually perceive the cold very differently to men. So for women particularly and um, around their cycle and their period and all those types of things have to be factored into their cold exposure as well. So our understanding of cold is becoming a more nuanced than it used to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Every, every month that goes on, there's more research coming out. So yeah. uh, well, cool. Well, Neil, uh, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me with breathe with Neil, breathe with N I A L L.com or the same on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, there's also the Breathe with Neil podcast. Wherever you listen to your podcast, you'll find me. Yeah, and I just want to give a plug too. You've got videos on YouTube. You've got an app. And we listen to, like I said in the beginning of the podcast, uh, Josie and I listen to Neil's voice to lead us through guided breath sessions. So if you like the Irish Rogue and you know how Neil is calm and presenting, uh, go ahead and check that out if you want to follow along and learn how to do some of this stuff. It's nothing is rocket science at all. It's just, you know, kind of the beats you take on inhales and exhales and holding it. Um, so definitely want to give a plug for you on that. But uh, Thank you. all of this will be in the show notes too down below. I'll give you links for everything so you can reach out to Neil. But I can't recommend uh, his books higher. And um, you guys all know that listen to this, I'm a big proponent of the cold and just the benefits it's had in my life to include um, a, a young daughter that I believe came from the cold and breathing training. In fact, our nickname for her is Ice Baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. It's like you better put a cold on, coat on her to go outside. I'm like, that's Ice Baby. She's gonna be fine. And she doesn't even pay attention to the cold. So <laughs> she's melting the ice. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, anyway, Neil, thanks so much for joining us. If you guys like this podcast, feel free to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. YouTube's a great place to get bonus content and prepathletics.com. Be sure you sign up for the newsletter so you don't miss a thing. In fact, uh, I think Neil was mentioned in the last newsletter there. So we'll try to put him again in the new one. And uh, yeah, Neil, thanks so much for joining and uh, have a great day in Ireland. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really great to catch up. All right, take care.